The English poet John Betjeman is really responsible for the title of this program. For when Mother Mary Martin died on the 27th of January, there was a collection of his poems among her books with this inscription. For Mother Mary, from John Betjeman, with gratitude for prayers about Aer Lingus on January the 20th, 1964. Miracles do happen. That was what John Betjeman wrote. His friend Lady Wicklow had invited him to read some of his poems in Dublin to raise funds for Mother Mary, and the function was completely booked out. On the day he was due to arrive, London Airport was hit by one of the worst fogs that could be recalled for many a long day. And in the early hours of the morning he rang me up to say that there had been a fog the day before, there were vast numbers of people left behind, and that the airport was completely fog-bound. But if there was any chance of getting away, uh, could I do anything this end with Air Lingus or to, to try and get away? As he didn't think he'd get away, there were so many people, even if it was air, air cleared, as there were so many people left behind from the day before. So I immediately got in touch with Air Lingus and had only to mention that it was for Mother Mary uh, for them to say, well, it would have been quite impossible in any other circumstances to take a passenger out of turn. But in these particular circumstances of letting down Mother Mary's evening and all that's planned, we must, of course, get him out if any plane gets out. In addition to that, they kept me informed at hourly intervals of the state of the weather at London Airport. And right, right up to four o'clock in the afternoon, there seemed no hope of any plane getting out that day. At the same time, I kept at hourly intervals in contact with the medical missionaries at Droida. And at one point, after I had rung up a few times, Mother Mary came on the phone herself and urged me not to worry, not to get excited, not to fuss. She said, don't you worry, just go straight ahead with plans, he'll be here on time. Another few hours passed and no word from London Airport and I had almost despaired and wondered what to do with between seven and eight hundred people sitting in a large hotel ballroom when suddenly the telephone rang and here was John Betjeman himself at Dublin Airport crying out to be met. So by rushing to Dublin Airport we got him in time for his poetry reading. Betjeman protesting or opening his... Um, show by saying he never believed in miracles until today because when he arrived at Dublin Airport and in fact later that day he heard it was the only plane that had got in for in or out of London Airport for two days. And you couldn't be with Mother Martin very much without believing. She had such quiet, simple faith, conviction it would come. Difficulties they were made to be overcome that then money, money will come. It's, it's God's work. If it is then the things will melt away and it will be found. That was her vision. She couldn't argue very much. She couldn't prove. She she wasn't very intelligent, that, you know. She had a woman's instinct and a woman's insight and a woman's conviction, which is stronger than any reason thing, you know. She had that. Father Hugh Kelly, S.J., a lifelong friend of Mother Mary and of the medical missionaries, who died in Drada a few weeks before her. What John Betjeman saw as a miracle was a very small one, compared with the building and staffing of 29 hospitals and many, many more clinics and convents right across the globe. But everyone who came in contact with Mother Mary Martin was impressed by the tremendous force of her faith. I was teaching in Drogheda during the school year 1952-53 and it was during that time, I can't exactly remember the exact date now, that the hospital went on fire. The following day, uh, Brother Maloney and myself went up to Mother Mary Martin to sympathise with her on her trouble. And she passed a remark which, to me, was typical of the woman. Well, Brother, she said, when I started this hospital here, it was during the war, and the aeroplanes were flying over, bombing Belfast, and my brother said to me, Mother Mary, you're very foolish to build a hospital here at this time. And my answer then, brother, was, well, God has given it to me, and if God wishes to take it away, then he will. And now he has taken it. She didn't mind the expense, although money wasn't very good at that time with the order. But uh, if it was necessary, it was God. They were always short of money, weren't they? Oh, yes, always. And it was always coming in by miracles. Well, it came. 
that that's the extraordinary part of the thing. It came. The and she'd say, Oh, be all right now. God'll provide. God'll look after us. Completely undaunted if she was asked to start a hospital for four hundred beds in the south of Italy as she was asked to do. Completely yes, undaunted yes. by the prospect and uh, quite certain that uh, with the help of God she'd have it out underway within a reasonable time that would have seemed impossible to any architect. She felt she was doing a work that God wanted to be done and that uh, he gave her that idea and she was going to do it. That's all about it. And she never reasoned about it. Difficulties never bothered or troubled her. No matter all oh, that'll cost a lot, we'll do it, we'll do it. Will you build, couldn't you build cheaper? We'll build the proper thing, we'll do the right thing. Couldn't you give a shorter train into that? So give her the best. That didn't, no pinchback business. No pinching or no scraping that. When you do a thing, do it well. Mary Helena Martin was the eldest daughter of Thomas and Mary Martin of Glenageary, County Dublin. She was born on the 25th of April, 1892, the second child in a family of 12. Her people owned a prosperous business in Dublin. When she was only eight years of age, she got rheumatic fever after a drive home from Glen Cullen in an open car during a snowstorm. And as a result, she suffered from a weak heart all her life. She and her sister Violet volunteered in 1914 as VADs, Voluntary Aid Defence Nurses, and she served in military hospitals in France and Malta. In Drauda, the sisters have a postcard which she sent from Malta to a friend in Clyde Road. It is dated the 7th of January 1916 and is a photograph of herself and her soldier patients with the message, I'm curing them all in fine style. Very likely her experience during the war prompted her to train as a nurse, but one city hospital refused her because she had no academic qualifications even though she'd been educated at famous convents in Dublin and England and at a finishing school in Germany. So she went to Glasgow to a home for unmarried mothers. And here the Reverend Mother had misgivings about accepting such a finely dressed young lady. But Mary Martin persevered until her health gave out and she had to return home. And this was to be the pattern of a lifetime, one venture after another, ending in yet another breakdown in health. But later she trained as a midwife in Hollis Street, and soon after she spent her first three years in Nigeria. She went out at the, at the invitation of that great missioner, Dr. Shannon. That's one of our great modern Irish men who has never been yet recognised. He really was the spearhead in, in our modern missionary effort, which in my mind is the biggest the biggest thing we've done since the explosion after St. Patrick's time. I think we're true to type in an extraordinary way. When we get the faith, we give it. And I think since 1916, that uh, missionary explosion, I think, has been an amazing thing in this country. She was invalided home from Nigeria for the first time. In fact, the doctors told her she'd never be strong again, and she had put out of her mind any work or any religious vocation. That was an impossible thing. She was to be a permanent invalid. So I used to meet her regularly then. I went out to a place at her Green, Green Bank in Monkstown. She used to be in bed there. I used to go out there. We'd have talked to that. She always had that idea, nursing that idea, you see, of uh, founding an order on new lines. She had seen the desperate condition of medical condition of the people in Nigeria, especially maternity work the appalling loss of life of children and the sufferings of mothers. And she felt that something should be done, that you can't go merely and give the word of God to these poor people. You must make life worth living for them. And that that was a, 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 a splendid act of charity, do you see, to help them in, in such a dire need as that. She had that in her mind always, but it seemed an impossible thing. That was the maternity, obstetrical work was not permitted to women by the church or to priests. And consequently that was closed, there was nothing to be done, but she hoped and hoped. She inspired a few friends, a few girls who were chiefly civil servants, or, well a few anyway, gave her ideas to them and they 
came, gathered round her quietly. There was no organization of any kind, but uh, they began to, to meet often and then to discuss things and to look, have visions and dreams and aims that way. And then when she had um, uh, quite a little group, then she got a chance then of developing in this way that she was asked by the prior of Glen Stoll, the Benedictine monastery there, school there, to take over the care of the school and the kitchen and that, and uh, uh, in return they would stay there then and they would get a spiritual education then from one of the monks. Do you think that her um, the, the spirit of her order is affected by that contact very with the much, Benedictines? Very much. She herself had a great connection with the Benedictines. Her brothers were at school there, they were at school at Downside, and she herself had a very strong leading towards the Benedictine spirituality. Yes. And she, in fact, she says it in her constitutions that their spiritual spirit is a Benedictine spirituality, a certain quiet interior peace, a simple kind of prayer, and uh, that would show itself in a a very distinctive uh, spirituality that would be and it's uh, th that was hers and she gave it to the others too uh, she never cared I don't say she thought it the Jesuit spirituality she, but she, she was attracted to the Benedictine more contemplative and more quiet and attachment to the office and attachment to the liturgy and to church services she had a very strong movement in that direction Bishop Moyna, Prefect Apostolic, came home from Nigeria in 1934, looking for just the kind of help Mary Martin had in mind to give, and they met. And even though she was once again a patient in hospital, she asked him if he'd sponsored the kind of medical missionary congregation that she had in mind. So uh, I said, perhaps uh, with the thought back of my mind that this... Uh, would not really eventuate or come about, that um, I said that I would accept them. And uh, I suppose I was really influenced by the extraordinary faith and uh, courage with which this frail person uh, spoke of doing this work for God. So Bishop Moyner returned to Calabar. And... Um, it was proposed that the Sisters of the Holy Child, who had come to Nigeria in 1930, same time as I did myself, that they would um, act as um, nov novice mistress and um, give housing and accommodation to the uh, Miss Martin and the girls who were to come with her. And um, I had urged that this coming be postponed, as the sisters were not quite uh, ready yet. Um, but uh, I had a cable from my, my Father Whitney in December 1936 saying that Mary Martin and two companions were on one of the boats coming to West Africa. And uh, they arrived in uh, after Christmas, sometime I think in January 1937. And in that um, same year, Archbishop Roberry, who was apostolic delegate, was about to visit uh, all the missions in Nigeria. He came to us from the Cameroons, and um, this, the Mary, Mary Martin and the companions, uh, Mother Magdalene uh, O'Rourke and my own sister, who uh, had joined the group, um, were already in, in the care of the Holy Child Sisters. So I um, was um, pleased to find that Archbishop Roberry was enthusiastic about the whole project. I think he had known the Martin family while he was secretary to Archbishop Robinson in Dublin and um, uh, evidently knew of Miss Mary Martin's intention and was enthusiastic. So he said uh, I was to go ahead and draw the appeal to Rome requiring permission for approval of the foundation, which I did, and he did the translation into Italian, and we sent off the letters by airmail to Rome, uh, uh, requesting also th uh, that mother, in view of Mother Mary's period in Kilishandra, 
She had done a year, a canonical year in Kilishandra, and also due to the religious training she had undergone in um, Glenstall with the Benedictines. Uh, and due to these facts, that he requested that uh, she be permitted to make her religious profession without any further novitiate. <coughs> and the other two sisters who accompanied her uh, were to make uh, to have one year's novitiate in Nigeria with the Holy Child sisters. Well, in that uh, same year, um, in March, I think, uh, Mary Martin became extremely ill. She had, as you may have heard, um, uh, an arthritic heart condition from earlier years, and I, I assume that it was malaria she had contract, contracted in Nigeria, and she became so ill that we ha she had to be carried down to the, the government hospital in Port Harcourt. Uh, and uh, while she was there, the permission to receive her vows um, came from Rome uh, a very, uh, at a very short um, a period of time. Normally one expected to, in those days, to receive a reply from Rome after perhaps six months or even longer. But the reply came uh, very sh quickly by air mail, and uh, we were authorized to receive her profession in Port Harcourt. I went down there with two Holy Child sisters as witnesses, and uh, she was in bed in the government hospital, and there she made her religious profession. And uh, at the same time, she had been booked to go home by boat to Ireland. The doctor in Port Harcourt, Dr. Braithwaite, Scotsman, a very kindly but blunt, straightforward man, said, this woman was never to return to Nigeria again. Let me never see this woman in, uh, in West Africa again, he said to me. And uh, she was taken on to the boat, uh, winched up uh, in what they call a mammy chair there on the west coast. Anybody who was very ill and unable to climb ladders and so on, was put his sitting in a chair, winched onto the deck and carried into the cabin where they were to stay during the journey. So um, we said goodbye to Mary Martin then and uh, uh, I returned with the two Holy Child sisters. Well, she didn't die and uh, she was ill for a good time but she came home. then. She set about then uh, founding a novice and she founded that in Cullum. That's a place of some miles north of Drona, and it was a wonderful episode in the history of the order. I mean, used to go up, pay, pay periodic visits, and they turned a little place up on a sort of an attic with the great big wooden beams. They turned that, in, and I used to harangue the three or four sisters uh, up in the attics. Do you see? <laughs> so then there was the opening of on the eighth of December. Was it 37 or 30 years, whatever it was? It was a wonderful day, and Colin was on the map for the first and last time. There was bunting in the streets. The nuncio came, the cardinal came, civic guards came. The, the city fathers of Draw came out in their new in their new clothes. Bottle green coat, big buttons, three-cornered hats and these. Oh, marvellous. And I preached the sermon, you see. There was no light on the church, and I, how I read my manuscript, I don't know. But anyway, it was a marvellous day, and Father Corcoran, God rest his soul, a good, decent, holy man, he was on, uh, uh, walking on air. He was on the crest of the wave, and that lasted then for a few months, and then there came the great chance. Monsignor Callan, he was administrator drawder, and he had a little cottage hospital there, and... Um, he offered, would you take over that? It was one smallish little house with a little wing, a tiny little thing, a very small business. Would she take over that as a little hospital worker? Well, it was an innovation she couldn't refuse because it gave her a chance of doing medical work and training sisters and then doing the work of the order, you see. So she took it over then, a very tiny little seed it was. And then I used to go regularly there and I see the plans of the other places on the ground. Hello, are you going to Villiers? That'll be the novice of December. I'm surveying one of the very first of them one day. 
Every time I go there, there's a new one was built. They simply seem to spring up out of the ground. The, for 30 years, for over 30 years, building and that never ceased in John. There was always employment for men then. Peter Tormey, a carpenter, was one of these. I was working for Desmond Martin, as I say, doing jobs around the country and in the city and all that sort of thing, you see. But the war being on, work was getting slack, you see. So I was thinking of uh, emigrating at that time, same as everyone else. And he got to hear about it. So he says, no, no, he says, uh, I don't want you to go. He says, I have other plans for you. He says, when this is all over, he says, there won't be anybody left in the country. So I stayed on with him. And then eventually uh, I came down to draw order. And um, did Mother Mary Martin provide a house for you? Uh, no, she didn't, she, but she provided the means of getting it, you see. You have a house and in the town in Drawdy, have I have a house you? in the town in Drawdy, yes. And she took an interest in this, did she? Oh, yes. Yes, she came, she came to each of the houses I was going to look at, you see, and uh, we passed over two or three until we finally got this one now. And was this, this because good. she wouldn't approve of, it, of the...? Well, she didn't, like, she didn't like the idea that there was nowhere for the children to play. You see, there wasn't uh, much of a garden or space attached to the others, and there's a fine garden and plenty of facilities for the children now where they are. My eldest boy now is in the laboratory down there. He's a, a laboratory technologist down there with them, you see. And um, she was asking me about them one day, and she was the eldest boy, she asked me about him, what was he doing? So I told him, uh, told her that she was going, he was going to... Uh, Kevin Street Technical School for chemistry and something else, do you see? Oh, she says, that's interesting, she says. And uh, she says, now she says, she looked up her papers on the desk. She says, uh, I have an advertisement, she says, here, she says, to send to the independent uh, advertising for a trainee laboratory technician. She says, would he be interested? So I said, I'm sure he would. I'll ask him when I go home anyway. So uh, when I came down the following morning, I told her, yes, he would be into it. Oh, well, she says, I won't send that to the paper yet. She says, I'll put him on six months' trial in the laboratory. What manner of woman was this Mother Mary Martin, who did so much in spite of constant ill health, wartime shortages, and her fair share of well-meant opposition? She could charm the birds off the trees or cash from a cardinal. I've forgotten who said that to me when speaking of Mother Mary Martin, but I don't really think it was unjust. She had considerable charm and realism. It was the realism rather than the charm which induced one cardinal in particular, his eminence of Boston, Cardinal Cushing, to assist with financing the International Missionary Hospital of Our Lady of Lourdes at Drada. I would say very feminine, yes, and yes. gave uh, an impression always of frailty. I mean, long before her um, illness, or she, of course she ha she had suffered a great deal from illness in her lifetime. But I'm not thinking so much of um, physical frailty, but of character, of gentleness, of quietness, of essentially a, a, a feminine. If she hadn't been in religious life, I would say she was very much a man's, a man's woman, you know. Yes, very much yes. the type of woman that would appeal to a man. She's a wonderful person to know. I don't know what it is about her. You, you, you get that feeling that if she comes in, you stand up immediately. You know, and she never orders you or commands you to do anything. Would you mind doing this? Would you mind doing that? She just tells you what she wants and she leaves you to it. And you do and it cheerfully? Oh, you go out of your way to do it. Yeah. I, when the first part of the hospital was being opened, I remember it's three o'clock in the morning and we were all there, of course, rushed and bustled, all the VIPs were coming for the opening and all that sort of thing. And she was along in the corridor, on her knees, cleaning the tiles, the floors. Yes. That's the type of woman she was. 
Well, tell us about the cigarettes. <laughs> well, I was working in her office one day. Now, the office would be only about 16 or 18 foot square. She had her desk in it and her bed. Now, she had no big office or big... anything big at all. It's just a plain ordinary office. And I was putting up new helmets and curtain rail on the windows. I was there about, well, maybe an hour and a quarter, an hour and a half or so. And she suddenly said, Peter, when did you give up smoking? So I turned round on the ladder and I told, well, Mother, I, there's time and place for everything. I wouldn't like to be smoking in here while you're working. Oh, nonsense, she says. Any man that's whistling or smoking is happy. And she pulled out the drawer on the side of her desk and produced cigarettes. She was a very, very attractive woman and very feminine, very d refined and delicate, a lady to her fingertips, if you mean. And she looked awfully well always in anything she wore and that. Uh, I mean, that way I would, almost certainly. Very ladylike she was indeed and very attractive and very beautiful at that time, you know. Nice fair complexion and fair hair, do you see? And uh, oh, she was very attractive. She really had a wonderful way with uh, clerics. Yes. They fed out of her hand. <laughs> and then she had a little doll and room with her then dressed in her, oh, the carnival's pal, marvellous, that's a man. I said, oh, really? oh they, they never saw an art like that, you see, to seem something new and fresh and uh, eminently useful and practical, you see. She brought a doll oh, with her? Yes, just to show their dress and that. Oh, she had, she had an tremendous influence at Rome, tremendous. Some of the very biggest men, they did see that here was something really new and fresh, something that could be supported. Uh, filling a, meeting a, an obvious need and meeting it in the truest way, you know. Professional, technical skill, the, the, the equipment, the proper dress, the proper training, the proper approach. Here was something quite a break with the new and union and with the new demands and the new world in which we're living in. So that they, they, they approved entirely of her. Mary Phelan, like Father Hugh Kelly, died before Mother Mary Martin. She had then been in charge of the maternity hospital in Drada for 30 years. And she spoke to me in 1969, after Mother Mary had sent her to visit the foundations in East Africa to mark her Silver Jubilee as matron. I met Mother Mary first in 1941. I don't think it's to my credit that I've got to admit I spent three years avoiding her before that, when I was asked by her sisters to go and see her out at the House of Studies in Rosemount. I was also asked to go and see her when she was over in London, and I happened to be over there, I think it was 1939, and uh, I, I didn't meet her then either. And then one day she walked into the National Maternity Hospital where I was Labour Ward sister and I met her. I'd had the erroneous idea that she was um, one of these very large, overpowering superiors and that was why I didn't want to meet her in the beginning. And I had, well, I had, I was really taken in when I met Mother Mary. That she was the very opposite to the visual mental picture I had had of her. Mother Mary was one of the most charitable women I have ever met. And that is how I will always remember her. Not for all she has done in Drogheda, all she has built up, everything else, for, for the order that she has put on its feet, being the Superior General, but for her tremendous charity. Two lots of people stand out in my mind that um, she was so very charitable towards. And first, those of those was the unmarried mother, and secondly, alcoholics. She has done a tremendous amount in a very quiet way for both of these lots of people who needed the help at the time. And she was able to give practical help on account of having the hospital. Yes, she was always able to give practical help. And if she wanted to do it in any other way, she got somebody else to do it. Mother Mary could always get you to do, could get anybody to do what she wanted done. I think perhaps, uh, apart from her spirituality, she was made perhaps a little bit hypnotic. Was she a very feminine woman? Very. 
extremely feminine, always, with terrific charm of manner. When I first knew her, she was ill. That was this just before I went to, to Drogheda. And uh, she was um, lying on a couch, do, getting all her business done, all her writing and everything. She had to have a lot of rest in those days because she's always had some sort of weak heart. And she was having a certain amount of rest all the time, most of the day, as a matter of fact. And she had all her writing materials all around her with a cold cup of tea beside her. And she um, would, would get all her work done, no matter what, how, she, how she was feeling. And was she available to people if you wanted to go and talk to her? Um, she was never too busy, was she? Never. She was never too busy to see anybody who wished to or wanted to see her, or particularly anybody that was in any form of trouble. It's, she was, it was amazingly good in that way. Well, now, I have enjoyed my association with her because I've always had very close contact with her. She's always been so very, very grateful, and she made you feel that you were, you were the person that the gratitude was due to, and really, I feel that her hospital was an extremely pleasant place to work in, for the simple reason that there was nobody to interfere with you. It was a private hospital, began in that way, and uh, there was no nobody at all, like a board of governors, or anything that way. And she never, in all those 25 years, ever said no to me, anything I wanted to do. No, she never interfered in any way. Did you go to work for her immediately? Oh, no, I didn't. I, um, I was an examiner in Belfast at the time, and I used to go up and down to Belfast. It was during the war, and it meant going up and down by train. Um, Mother Mary used to come and invite me to stay in uh, Drogheda when I'd be on my way up, and I went once. And I saw how very small the place was, and I had always been used to very big hospitals with tremendous turnover. And uh, she, she then asked me if I would go to her for two years. She said that was all she wanted, to get the training school started. So it had been started in a small way, but she wanted it, it completed and to get, get on its feet. And this is why she asked me to go for two years. So uh, I decided in 1943 that I would go. I, um, I did, I went there in November 1943, and sometime later I told her that I had spent three years in the beginning avoiding her. And she said, oh, my dear, you don't, you underestimate the um, power of prayer. Did you feel she was a very prayerful woman? I did. I always did. But she was also a very practical woman. But she was, she never attempted anything that she didn't come and ask, even me being an outsider, for prayers for this project, whatever she was doing. It was the first thing she did. And when she'd go away in the early years and or when I went away anywhere, she would um, write me long letters of all the things she had in mind to do, which she eventually did. And unfortunately, these letters got burned in a disastrous fire we had in 1952. It would have made a very wonderful chapter on her life in any book, for, because all her thoughts and ideas were there that were realised in later years. She broke new ground as a missioner, didn't she? Yes. She was entirely medical. This was She never wanted education, and she left that to the people that were, were doing it, but she wanted to be, uh, her order, to be a medical mission only. To minister to the, to the sick, and particularly the mother and child. This was her first ambition, and that was why she opened the maternity hospital first, in a very small way, in a private house in Drogheda. It's now got, we're working on 90 beds and have over 2,500 babies a year, so it's grown tremendously in that quarter of a century. Mary Phelan summed up her impression of three months with the medical missionaries in East Africa. It is only then I realised what Mother Mary had really done. She, um, you, nobody can give you a visual mental picture of a foreign country like that or what's happening in it. 
you have to go and see it. And I've had my eyes opened to see what the sisters are doing, the nurses, the doctors, the chemists, all of them in these areas, and to see what they have done over the number of years they have been there. I really have a far better idea now of the missions than I have ever had. And it was so interesting. I got out to do clinics way out in the bush. We had one clinic held up in, in Lucky Tong in the north of the Kenyan desert under a thorn bush. They have no buildings at all there. And it was really very, very, uh, well, it was very worthwhile. And it really opened your eyes to the poverty of the desert and, and to see what the sisters are trying to do. They have a small plane there, and for that they couldn't get around, and there is a sister pilot. Well, have we anything else now to say about Mother Mary Martin? Uh, well, the, uh, the only thing that I want to finish up by saying is that having known her for a quarter of a century, she is the kindest and the most generous woman I have ever known. I could not... I don't know of anybody that would, would equal her in kindness and generosity, and that was to everybody. Well, we heard Bishop Moyner recall that a doctor in Port Harcourt told him in 1937 that Mother Mary was never to set foot in West Africa again. So, if Providence has a sense of humour, this last recording is meant to make the angels smile. It is Mother Mary Martin's own voice in a message to the rest of the medical missionaries, and it was sent almost 30 years after that doctor's edict. I've just finished my visitation here in Calabar, and today I'm leaving for Ibadan, and then from there to uh, Ugoja. But before leaving, I wish to wish you all a very, very happy Christmas. As you know, we are all very fond of the season of Advent, and we will all be united in preparing ourselves for the coming of our Divine Lord again at Christmas. We'll be united in prayer, in joy and love on that night at the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. I wish I could spend longer now and tell you all about the visitation here. It has been a time of great consolation to me. And I would like that you all could see what I've seen, the accomplishments done by the generosity and the self-sacrifice of the sisters. It's just a marvellous work. My only fear is that they're really overworking. So now I ask you to spend this Advent in fervent prayer, asking God to send as many, many vocations that will be able to help them out here to carry on the great work that they have done.